My next guest is Dr. Toby Travis. Dr. Travis is the founder of Trust Ed, a framework for business organization and school improvement focused on the development of trusted leaders. He is an executive consultant with the Global School Consulting Group, an adjunct professor for the International Graduate Program of Educators for the State University of New York College at Buffalo, and an experienced teacher and school administrator. He is currently superintendent at Village Christian Academy in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Dr. Travis is the author of the award-winning book, Trust Ed, The Bridge to School Improvement, which is available on Amazon, featured in Forbes magazine, and named Book of the Month in November, nominated for Book of the Year in 2021 by The Magic Pen. Welcome to the podcast, Toby. Thank you so much. Great to be here with you. Well, it's great to have a conversation on trust among school leaders and just trust in the educational profession um, in general. I think it's a very important topic. Uh, but we're going to start out with the question I ask everybody uh, to launch uh, the reporting. Uh, tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out. Well, as I shared with you earlier, uh, I, I instantly reflect back to my very first formal classroom experience. And uh, I had I had been a seminar leader and teacher for years. I was kind of, you know, second career coming into mm -hmm. to teaching and wanted to get off the road. And so, you know, came into a teaching position and was not prepared for the level of disconnect between faculty and admin and really in some sectors, a very toxic environment. Mm -hmm. and, and just seeing, um, and trying to figure out, okay, well, what are the issues here? Why, why is everybody so angry with each other? And why do we see, you know, why do, why do teachers see administration as the enemy and administration seeing teachers and sometimes parents as the enemy, uh, rather than, hey, I thought this was about the kids and about learning, you know, so kind of all my, uh, my illusions of, uh, of what school should be were just shattered instantly at my first job. And within, Within, really within the second year, I had already been encouraged to think about moving into administration. And so for a few years, I was teaching classes and doing part-time admin. I was a middle school coordinator. And then as I came into a principalship um, and really had the opportunity to start addressing some of those issues, and this was all in the same school, um, really, uh, we, we just had some very frank conversations with our leadership team and started to think about, okay, how do we, first of all, just acknowledge the fact, yes, trust is broken. Let's start mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And, and, and then open up the conversation about, okay, how, how do we repair this? So, so that, was, that was kind of the motivation to start addressing the issues. It was greatly helped by a friend of mine, David Horsager, wrote a bestseller called The Trust Edge, uh, went well, number one on Wall Street Journal, I think, a few years ago. And mm -hmm. actually, Dave came down. Uh, I was in, this was an international school, and uh, David came down to Ecuador, is where we were, and uh, was, uh, was just great in helping us kind of think through uh, strategies. But interesting, what I found in, 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 in talking and then working and learning a lot from David, though, is schools are unique. Mm -hmm. And and so that was the motivator for me then as I went into my doctoral program to start looking, okay, what does trust research, what does rebuilding trust uh, and all those elements uh, associated with that look like specifically for school leaders? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, that's, and then here we are years later, you know, is, and that's really what the book is about is, okay, when we, we know trust is critical, but what does that look like specifically for mm -hmm. principals and department heads and superintendents? What are the specific steps that they need to do in the world of education to ensure there's high levels of trust? So that's kind of where that all began. It was coming out of those trenches of, I don't like working in this kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I, I, I'm just kind of condensing that story really quick. We intentionally worked on that for a number of years. And before I left that school, we, and this was a private school, it hit its, its um, highest enrollment in history. And I mm -hmm. largely credit my team because when, when leadership is trusted, teachers are happy and engaged. When teachers are happy and engaged, students succeed. And when students succeed, parents are happy. And, mm -hmm. and so that makes all the difference when it comes to enrollment. And so that, that was very affirming to see 
Uh, no, are there still and were there imperfections? Absolutely. There's no such thing as a perfect school or a perfect business. Um, but we saw marked improvement and we saw uh, the, the effects of that uh, could be tied directly, I believe, to that increased enrollment as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think in the pre-chat, you mentioned it took six years uh, for this turnaround in school culture yeah, to occur. Yeah. Right. And that, you know, it's one of the things when I'm, I'm coaching and training others, as we talk about a lot is, you know, you got to be into this for the long mm -hmm. haul. Mm -hmm. uh, when there's trust issues, they're not repaired quickly. They can be mm -hmm. repaired, uh, but you've got to be in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think also the fact that if you have um, a lot of turnover in staff and you're trying to um, improve school culture, you got to be on top of it from year to yeah. year when you have staff turnover and really follow through with what you're working on to change. Absolutely. And this is why, you know, it's so important that mission, vision, values are mm -hmm. clearly identified, articulated, protected, and, and constantly out there. You know, there's an old marketing phrase, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. Mm -hmm. So as school leaders, we've, we've got to know what our story is. We've got to tell it. we got to hire it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this also comes back to even just, you know, our beliefs and values around what is quality education? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. uh, what are our beliefs and values around the role of parents and teachers and, um, and make sure that those things are all well articulated and out front. Uh, they're the things that we assess and that we constantly train to. That's, that's how you build culture. And then you hire to that as well. Mm -hmm. I've actually seen some schools do a great job with that, especially, again, I go back to the international setting where turnover is a constant. You know, a lot of folks, they'll go teach in an international school to have the experience for a year or two. And so you've got this constant turnover. Well, how do you build consistency in that? Mm -hmm. You know your story and you hire to your story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, so let's talk about a little uh, bit about the framework. So you um, write about the six components of trusted leadership in your book. Um, so if you want to talk to me a little bit about the um, uh, how you help schools de develop school improvement plans and initiatives, and I think you have some slides you'd like to share and talk through. Sure, I can do that. Uh, let me just share my screen. So the um... The framework um, is evidence-based. These, uh, these it's all research validated, so, and I am a bit of a data nut. So when I first started looking into trust research, and you're thinking, "Oh, these are soft skills. How are you going to be able to put any kind of you know clear numbers to what this looks like in building?" And and with the help of some wonderful people, um, smarter than me, and uh, I, I learned a lot from in that in that process, we were able to come up with an assessment tool uh, that I there. And again, there is no perfect assessment, but but it's a very effective assessment in, in driving and informing school improvement through the development of leadership. So uh, some of the, the key research, um, and not to go terribly deep into this, but this is one that I know is alarming to folks. And what's interesting about this stat, Dana, is it's true whether we're talking the business world or the school world. So if you look at business research on improvement initiatives that are happening in small, medium, even large businesses, 70% um, of them fail. Mm -hmm. School improvement initiatives, 70% of them fail. And when you look at the why behind that, often you'll, you'll see literature that talks about, well, it was, it, there were failures in execution, but you have to look behind that too, and then look at this research that shows us that the number one indicator of successful schools is trusted leadership. And then you start, you know, you start putting those two numbers together. You realize, ah, right, this is what's going on. And what's interesting about the success research is it doesn't seem to matter how you define success. I mean, mm -hmm. take a look at this. When there are high trust levels, we see increased retention of students and quality staff. We see higher student achievement levels. Catch that. There's a direct correlation between the trust level of a principal in a building and to the achievement level of the students. We see fewer behavior management issues. And, and I love to talk and train on this. And, and there's others who do this, again, better than myself. But it's a key element to realize that the higher the trust level between the administrator and the teacher, we actually see fewer behavior management issues. And, and there's many elements to that as it kind of uh, trickles up, uh, I like to say, because if you see it modeled between the administrator and the teacher, then teachers are modeling it with their students. Mm -hmm. You know, culture trumps curriculum every time and, you know, all of that stuff. 
stronger community relations. You know, schools, whether private, public, parochial, um, proprietary, they all have a level of success based on the community surrounding them. And mm -hmm. if you want to increase community involvement, community relations, focus on developing high levels of trust. Uh, a major study that was done on discretionary energy. So it's basically talking about volunteerism. Uh, saw again, a direct correlation between the willingness, and this was talking about employees, mm -hmm. employees willing to engage and volunteer above and beyond the paycheck when there's high levels in uh, trust on the leadership. And then of course, greater financial stability. Again, a really important one uh, in the private sector. But defining trust is really complex, is what I discovered on the front end. And in fact, we'll often, in a training session, we'll do a word cloud and we'll say, okay, give me three words when you think of the word trust, and the board will be just filled mm -hmm. because it is complex. We use a short word to talk about a lot of things. And this is why we need to be able to have, I believe, um, a visual construct to be able to understand and get our arms around the issue. And I have to give full credit to my wife. I was, I had finished my doctoral program. I remember sitting at the kitchen table and I'm saying, okay, how do I make it practical though for folks to understand this? Mm -hmm. And she says, yeah, and she says, well, sweetie, isn't it? It's really just like a bridge. Mm -hmm. You've got to have all these components connected for it to be trustworthy. And I'm like, Yes, beautiful. And then I went back and looked at the research and it almost perfectly fit into six components of constructing a suspension bridge and really seven if we talk about the cables. And here they are very quickly and, and I won't go into detail. This kind of, that's what the book's for, right? Um, there's a foundation to a bridge. Well, in leadership, we're talking about beliefs and values. In a bridge, there's a substructure, and, and this connects everything to the foundation. Well, in leadership, it's about consistently connecting and supporting everything we do in the school to what we say we believe and what those values are. In fact, that's, that's typically the number one area where I see trust falling away. School leaders, school boards even, will say, we believe this about education, we believe this about the students, but then practice and protocol and, and behaviors of leadership do not match what they say they believe and trust is broken. So repairing the substructure is all about consistency. The girders of a bridge, now those are the spans that go underneath the bridge, right? Mm -hmm. Here, I, I use that analogy to talk about our ability to contextualize and adapt. Every bridge is unique. And, and you will also see the girders are different based on the width of the bridge. Is the bridge going around a corner? Um, again, just the, the context of where the bridge is built. Well, trust is built in that ability to adapt and contextualize to the needs of students, to the needs of staff, to the needs of the community. The superstructure of the bridge, right? This is what we see from the, the greatest distance. Well, here we talked about intentionally building culture through intentionally building relationships. Uh, the bearings of a ridge. Now, these are often unseen, especially uh, even in large bridges, you, you don't realize that they're there, but these are the moving parts of a bridge. And here, kind of like the girders, we're talking about this ability to be flexible, but here's the key component in leadership. In order for leaders to be flexible, they've got to be involved. Mm -hmm. so there's no such thing as distant leadership. So these are leaders who, they're in the committee meetings, they're in the hallways, they're in the classrooms, they're engaged in what I call the nuts and bolts of education, which is curriculum, instruction, assessment, and, and learning environment. And then there is the deck of the bridge, which you know we, we think on a bridge, this is simple, right? It's a flat surface with a couple of lines and some lights. Well, it looks simple, but if you talk to engineers who design these things, you learn, no, oh, there's multiple levels and there's all kinds of science and physics that go into uh, a deck being made so it doesn't fall apart. And so it can withstand the weather and the flexing and all of that. And here, the, the basic idea is trusted leaders know how to take the complex and make it simple. Mm -hmm. The direction is clear. We know what lane we're in. We know where we're going. There are orderly systems so that um, there, there aren't surprises for anyone. So here we're talking about, you know, the, the deck is order and clarity. And then to tie these all together are the suspension cables. And that's where we'll talk about very specific skill sets. 
And numerous studies have identified what those are. We actually know there are 21 specific skill sets of leadership in school leadership that must be present among a leadership team. Uh, mm -hmm. No one individual can possess all those, but those, those suspension cables have got to be connected to counterbalance all of this. And then one last thing on this, Dana, is a critical element of the research is all six have got to be there. Mm -hmm. And if one is lacking, trust is lacking. So you might have someone who, again, they've got their values, their beliefs, they're well articulated. They might even be great in the super culture of building relationships. But if they're not involved, if, if they don't know curriculum instruction and, and learning environments, and they don't know education, mm -hmm. no, they're not going to be trusted. They might be great people. You might like them a lot but they're not going to really know how to lead. So there you go. That, those are the components. And this is what we assess and, and then help individuals and teams build their skill sets and competencies in those areas that need improvement. It also works uh, for HR uh, in creating a profile of who do we need to add to our team? Uh, mm -hmm. Because again, not, there is no super administrator who can do all of this. It is all about developing uh, leadership teams that can build competencies in these six areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a great, um, you know, metaphor for uh, a bridge and using those parts of the bridge. I've never heard it put that way and just uh, something your wife <laughs> just kind of mentioned to you and, and how you're looking at those parts and, you know, how everything can tie together. So you also have a, um, an assessment, Trust Ed Leader 360. Um, so how can this um, help leaders assess their trust level uh, amongst maybe a leadership team and also amongst the employees um, at their school? Right. So the 360 is uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's app based. You can do it on your mm -hmm. phone or uh, on any device. And basically a link goes out to uh, all of the staff. This is not a monkey survey or we, we use mm -hmm. a data mm -hmm. company to ensure anonymity and, and confidentiality. Uh, that, that's a critical element. It's brief. Actually, we've been able to design the assessment so it can be completed in 10 to 12 minutes. Okay. There are 48 questions. They're, again, they're all research-based questions. And out of those questions, uh, when we survey uh, a school population, uh, employee population about their administrators, we were able to give really good data on where an administrator sits in their level of competency in these six components of trust. Okay. And we get a team score, we get individual scores, uh, and then we're able to build action plans, professional development plans, um, determine, okay, is there some personal coaching that's needed here? Is there additional training that's needed? Is there a school-wide initiative that needs to be addressed? I mean, we mm -hmm. find that all administrators are low in a certain number. We're going to find, okay, no, there's, there's something school-wide here that's an issue. So the 360, um, actually, again, it can kick out personal data team data, school-wide mm -hmm. data, and, and a profile uh, data for, uh, for HR when you're looking to add somebody to the leadership role. And again, we, we use a company called SchoolRight, uh, okay. based out of Texas, and they administer uh, the assessment. And it, it's really fairly quick, and it's very affordable. I'm very thankful that SchoolRight has made it accessible, uh, really, to and schools around the globe are using it. And because our intent is to reassess every semester. Uh, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Here, what we're looking at is, no, let's let's get a baseline assessment, you know, just like we do in teaching. Let's see where the kids are at. Okay, let's see where the administrators are at. We set short-term goals. That was mm -hmm. something, again, that I, I learned from David Horsager's work, um, the value of short-term goals to build success quickly mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then reassess reestablish goals and, and do that continual planning cycle. And through that, we've seen yeah, some really, really fun and encouraging uh, turnarounds uh, with some teams. And now some of them not as quick as others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of distractions uh, yeah. uh, these, these last few years. Um, but um, but that's, that's the 360. That's what that assessment is about. And we have, a, we have one for business leaders. We have one for, for school leaders specifically. Uh, and there's also a self-assessment, and if uh, you remind me, I'll, I'll shoot a link to you that you can okay. share with your listeners. It's free. Now, okay. it's, it's not true data, you know, it, it's a, but it's a great conversation piece because you can go in and assess yourself and mm -hmm. uh, uh, say, okay, where, where am I on, on these six? It, it gives a very simple report. The, the 360 gives a rather 
uh, in depth, a lot of data. And there's an executive summary that comes with it as well. That's usually about 10 or 12 pages. But the self assessment will give you a little scorecard on how you did on the on the six. And it's great to compare those. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I'll ask administrators when we're first talking, go self assess, see what you think you're doing. And then we do the 360. Mm -hmm. And then we find what I call the trust perception gap, you know, okay. where we thought we were and where others think we are, because in, in this area, perception is reality. Mm -hmm. What our employees perceive about us is their reality, and that's what we must address. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, that's that's the assessment piece or the assessment tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds really a really good uh, way to uh, start building that trust wherever your school might be at. If there's a school that's um, had major issues for years or a school that just is um, having a change in leadership or a lot of turnover in staff, um, I think that's a great tool to use. But you know, any time we open ourselves up to be assessed by mm -hmm. our employees, builds trust. Yeah. You know, and it, well, open yourself and then listen. Mm -hmm. and, and giving employees, giving teachers opportunity to give feedback on their administrators, that action in itself is mm -hmm. a step towards building greater trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about um, some of the doctoral research you did in terms of the critical role of trusted leadership in business organizations and schools. But again, I, and I gave some highlights of that in the PowerPoint already. What we found uh, first in the literature review was, oh my goodness, you have all yeah. these benefits. But then what the, my work was really was uh, about connecting the specific behaviors, competencies, um, and disciplines that have been identified for uh, a number of years now by folks like Bob Marzano and his team that we've known about, but then connecting those to these six components of trust. So that was really, you know, one of my bringing to it is, okay, we know that trust is essential. In fact, if that's not taken care of, really what we found is nothing else going to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, that 70% of school improvement initiatives failing, well, that's because we're not dealing with the root issue. We're, you know, and I'm, I'm a big fan of all kinds of things that are, are happening and excited about what's happening in education, project-based learning and authentic literacy. Those are all you know, wonderful. And you want to see this you know, student-driven learning. Yes, yes, yes. But it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work if you haven't taken care of the leadership trust issue that mm -hmm. has to be foundational. And so what we basically the doctoral work was just looking at how do we do that? How do we assess it? And then how do we intentionally see improvement in those areas so that we can measure it, move it forward so that everything else can work? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you told me about um, some of your research and articles has been highlighted in Forbes magazine uh, three times in the last month. Uh, uh, so uh, it's about uh, the hesitancy, hesitancy of teachers coming back into the workplace, uh, current events that are happening with the max, uh, mass exodus of school staff, uh, just any time during the school year this year. So highlight some of that writing that you've done. Well, that you're, uh, obviously I was more surprised than anyone, <laughs> especially that, that three times in the last month uh, and, and, uh, and Forbes of all places, which uh -huh. is interesting that they're, you know, like maybe because I'm an academic, I guess, but um, I was in a conversation uh, with um, a gentleman who writes for Forbes and just had made the comment that I, I do think it's a trust issue. Is, is, well, it's, it is one of the major issues of the mm -hmm. hesitancy of people to come back to work. Now, we could talk about you know, educators who have left. We've known, actually, there was a, a Gallup study. There was a number of studies that have come out over the last few years. And the number one reason teachers leave is because of their supervisor. Yeah, uh, they do not feel supported. It's not kids. It's not behavior. It's not lack of resources. It's not compensation. It's um, uh, I don't trust my leader. He, uh, mm -hmm. he or she doesn't support me. And that's why they're leaving. Well, and then why are they not coming back? It's because they believe they're going to get taken advantage of. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, they're, they're just there's because there's so much catch up work now to do. And that was another article that uh, uh, I forget who published that one, uh, but uh, I, that may have been in the knowledge review where uh, I was talking about, we, we have to go back and recalibrate now. Yeah. You know, for us to be assessing students today based on assessments we were using pre-pandemic really isn't equitable to those students. You know, a lot of folks are talking about the learning loss. How do we deal with that? It's like, well, well wait, wait a minute. A learning loss means you've received the instruction. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so those those assessments we've been using, those standardized assessments, where they're assuming the student had received that instruction. Well, we've got now millions and millions and millions of kids who have not received that instruction. We're going to have to recalibrate those assessments mm -hmm. um, because the whole point of the assessment is to identify how well did they receive the instruction? How are they growing? And, and so that's another part of it, but it's put this pressure on teachers to catch up. And it's like, no, we're not going to catch up. We're going to assess where's the student at right now? What do they have the capacity to do? Educate them, invest in them for their future and in this current reality. And that it's, it's hard work. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I think, again, what, what was picked up uh, a couple of different times now by several magazines was this idea of we're not coming back to work because we don't trust our bosses to take care of us. Mm -hmm. And in the commercial world, and that was the article that just came out earlier this week, as we were talking about uh, who has higher priority, your clients or your employees, or in the school mm -hmm. setting, we would say, who has higher priority, parents and kids or teachers? And mm -hmm. I've argued for years, and, and it's not just an argument or opinion, it's the research, it, and I have the evidence that when we value teachers, when we support them, when we pay them well, when we challenge them, so it's not just mm -hmm. about giving them soft jobs. It's no, it engage them, support them, uh, challenge them, give them, uh, again, the, the capacity, the environment to work well, student achievement levels go out of the roof, right? And there's a direct correlation because when teachers are, 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 are happy, kids mm -hmm. get happy and they get engaged yeah. in the learning. When kids are engaged and happy and in the learning and, and high levels of achievement, parents are happy. So when parents are happy, then we get to be happy as administrators, but it has to be in that order. And yeah. where school leaders mess it up so many times is they'll see a real need of, of, of students or they see a real pressure from parents yeah. and they put that as a priority over the care of their teachers. And then it kills morale mm -hmm. and then teachers leave or get disengaged. Uh, you know, I was telling someone the other day, a good, a good practical step to gauge the school culture is when that final bell of the day rings, go walk around the campus and see how many teachers are still in the building. Mm -hmm. Highly engaged schools where teachers are well supported and they trust their leadership. Again, the, that, that discretionary time study I told you about, they hang out, they're working, they're collaborative, they're doing extra stuff. Mm -hmm. Where trust levels are low, no, it's a ghost town at 315. Yeah. Boom. The building's empty. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've, I've seen that happen myself. Like, uh, yeah, and then there's a lot of rumors, there's a lot of backstabbing and all oh, those yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, so it's just, it, it really trickles down and, and I've seen how it, you know, affects the student behavior and, you know, how, how students act because, you know, they look to the adults for the example. So. Well, uh, let's kind of shift and talk about the continual coaching and mentoring of school leaders that's needed. And I think uh, after the pandemic hit, a lot more leaders are trying to connect with others um, through Zoom and uh, through virtual means. But, you know, there are still a lot of uh, leaders, um, administrators in any type of capacity that are kind of on their own island. Um, they don't necessarily have any coaching in their district. Um, they might be the only administrator at their school. So uh, kind of what's happening, and you talked to me also about the, the, the departure rate, the percentage of leaders who leave uh, within a certain amount of years because they are um, isolated. Right. In fact, I just saw another report and it was saying 30%, uh, this was public school superintendents, 30% mm -hmm. um, are, are leaving this year. Wow. And that, that's the highest on record, I mean, we've we've never seen that kind of departure rate. Um, and you think about where we're going to be at next year. There's going to be so many vacancies for leadership now. That, that also provides perhaps some opportunity for aspiring leaders. Uh, there, you want a job in school leadership? It's it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. There's just tons of openings. But here's here's one of the things that I observe is one of the mistakes that boards make um, in the private world. School school owners make is they they hire the administrator. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. a super. I, I have a doctor, right? right? So they, they hire me to come in and, and lead the ship and just assume, hey, he's got the degree. I'm paying him, you know, a decent salary. Boom, he should just do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
these are probably the people who, uh, well, not more, but equal to the need of coaching and mentoring uh, teachers and, and students. The leaders need constant mentoring. Mm -hmm. I, I have been blessed all my life with mentors. And there have been a couple of seasons when I didn't have them. And I figured that out really. I was like, okay, why am I struggling so much? Like, no, I need somebody to talk to. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. not an employee. That's not a board member, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you need uh, someone who understands your world. And yet is that, that, that third party, you know, the third eye out there. And there is huge value in that. And so I'm always talking to school board members and to school owners. Uh, you have to ensure that your school leaders have got support. So whether that's through right, a professional coach or, or a consultant, uh, it can be a friend. It doesn't have to be a paid service. I, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate for a number of years as an administrator, literally across the, uh, the street for me was a, a large nonprofit organization and their CEO became one of my best friends. Well, he also became one of my mentors because we could relate at that leadership level and share mm -hmm. our, our woes and our problems and our challenges and brainstorm. And, and that was just, just a huge, huge uh, value and benefit. So I've seen it in my own life. Uh, and I've also seen so many drown mm -hmm. because they just feel like they're so alone. They, have, they can't talk to their employees. They can't talk to their board without feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm looking, I don't know what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. they, they need a safe place to go. And it kills marriages. So it's not take it home and, and, and talk to your spouse about it. Uh, no, you need a safe professional who understands the challenges and can also help you think through next steps. So um, critical, critical element. I'm honored. I, I only have a capacity to take on about six of those a year. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and it's some of the work that I enjoy the most is just connecting with those administrators um, and, and helping them navigate uh, their challenges. But it's, it's important work. It's essential work, actually, mm -hmm. for uh, the health and well-being of school leaders and for schools, because if school leaders are not healthy, their schools aren't healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of experienced leaders who are now um, working as consultants, uh, at least part time, <laughs> along with leading That's a true. school and, and you know, realizing yeah. that they they need to offer those services to help coach the yeah. newer leaders or leaders who feel lost and, and like they don't have anybody to talk to. And, you know, a lot of leaders that I meet with weekly in a mastermind, I mean, they are busy people, but, you know, they, they realize that this hour every Wednesday fills their cup, right? And we can be discussing a variety of topics, but, you know, and you could talk with a group or you could meet with somebody just individually. But I think just having those like-minded individuals where you're able to discuss an issue that's going on and, uh, just bounce ideas off of another um, really helps. Well, don't you think the value of podcast? I mean, even what, what mm -hmm. you're doing here. I mean, this is yeah. why podcasts have become so popular. I think people are looking for, you know, they're, they're looking for coaches. They're looking for input on, on ideas. They, they want people to understand their problems. And yeah. so uh, I think it's also part of what's going on with the podcast. And the reason I, I kind of laughed a little bit a moment ago is because I was thinking of another uh, world-class consultant friend of mine, uh, Will Power Harris, uh, mm -hmm. Will was saying, yeah, right now, you know, you throw a ball on the wall, it's going to hit a consultant. Mm -hmm. you know, cause, cause so many people, unfortunately, are leaving the business and the education world. And and, and so they look for self-employment, you know, as, as consultant. And another friend of mine just the other day, who's been a consultant for 30 some years, and he said, yeah, he's, he said, so many school administrators uh, or individuals call him and say, hey, we want to get into consulting. And he's like, well, what experience have you had doing that? Well, no, mm -hmm. I want to get started. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, good, good luck with that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I have an individual, I, I have an episode uh, that will be released when this comes out, but uh, she, I think she's been in the consulting field for, for 20 years. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't a one and done. It took about two years to really get a lot of clients. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've, we've really talked a lot about uh, just 
uh, a lot about your research, uh, the components of trust and, um, and how uh, leaders can uh, get support. And uh, out of everything we discussed, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? The importance of uh, self-reflection mm -hmm. um, and getting others input. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, you just we build trust just by asking our employees to give us feedback on our performance. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we we all do well to to find uh, others to speak into our lives, and and there's there's an element of mental health. Even there's a major study out on that that if you are open to reflection and open to others uh, speaking into your life. Um, it actually, it, it makes for greater mental health. Uh, if, for those who are not open, uh, actually we, we see, actually there are some elements of mental illness that are associated with those who are not open to being critiqued and, and taking um, self-reflection steps. So I, I think that, that would be an important piece to start. Um, I mentioned earlier, I am a bit of a data bug. I, there are lots of opinions that are out there, Dana, and there's lots of good ideas. Um, uh, I, I want to have the greatest confidence I can that, you know, life is short, time is short. Mm -hmm. I, we, I want to be investing in the steps that will make the most systemic difference in my life and in the organization that I'm working in. And therefore, I would also just counsel your listeners, um, you know, look to the evidence, look to the data. Um, don't just be, you know, leaning on whatever the latest pop idea is. Yeah, um, yeah. Talk to those that uh, have really done the homework and, and then use that, uh, that data, use that information to, to drive your next steps and inform what you're doing. And, and I, I guarantee you will see greater speed because then that's really what it's all about is how quickly can we correct the situation that we're in? How, how quickly can we get to that next initiative? Well, the speed will be generated in the improvement uh, when you're working with information that's that's real and true mm -hmm. and has been validated and measured. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of people are just thinking about what's the next big improvement we need to make, what's the next initiative. But when you realize that there are a lot of underlying issues and the, and the things that you need to take, you know, one step at a time, baby steps sometimes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You, you know, it's, uh, I've heard when someone talked about, you know, it's, you're driving a Lamborghini, you know, you got this powerful car, but you come down into a foggy valley. What do you have to do? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you're going to slow down. It doesn't matter how much horsepower you, you've got under the engine, you, you know, until you've got clarity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can't go quickly. Once you have clarity and, and clarity comes again through um, trusted leadership, and, and understanding uh, where are we going and why do we need to be there? But um, yeah, I, it's let the data drive that, get that addressed. And, and you mentioned professional development uh, initiatives. Often that too, I'm just seeing a lot of schools make mistakes. They're responding to some problem often. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some squeaky wheel, uh, there was some unfortunate incident maybe with a student and a teacher, parents got upset about something. And so they launch a, a PD initiative to try to address that rather than, no, let's use an assessment tool of our faculty and staff on their pedagogical, their teaching methods, mm -hmm. the, their assessment methods, and then let's use that data to drive our professional development. And that's another element that I, I work with schools. Uh, we've developed what we call the CALI method survey and CALI is an abbreviation for curriculum, instruction, assessment, learning environment method survey. Mm -hmm. But then we look at, okay, this is basically an assessment of teacher practice. And there's other really good assessments out there, by the way. It's, it's not, there, there was a, a group out of Wisconsin that came up with a, a fantastic um, tool as well. But the idea here is rather than our opinions and our anecdotes driving us, no, let's get the data. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's, let's get some numbers put together here and then let those numbers inform what we're going to work on next year or next semester. And again, what you'll find is when you do that, you got greater speed and improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, not just uh, kind of go off of a hunch or or a, an isolated incident, like you said. So that's really important to remember. Well, where can people connect with you and find you online? 
But the website is trustedconsulting.org. So that is probably the easiest place to, to find me and connect with me again, trustedconsulting.org. Uh, the book, Trust Ed, The Bridge to School Improvement is available on Amazon, or you can find the link uh, through the website. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity to, to be here and to, and to connect with your listeners. Well, thank you so much for being on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. It was a pleasure having you on.